Okay, uh, the goal for today's lecture is to talk about quasi-Newton's method. And I'm going to go back to 1970s today. So we have learned in the previous lectures that gradient descent is a cool algorithm. It converges to a stationary point, if at all it converges. The stationary point may not be optimal, but you can check the second order, second order sufficient condition to prove optimality of that particular point. Uh, we learned about some different algorithms for solving uh, gradient descent, different gradient descent algorithms for solving specific, specific optimization problems. And we also learned that Newton's method is actually extremely fast, much faster than the regular gradient descent method. So, now the problem is, the problem that I'm facing now is I know in the gradient descent algorithm I'm computing the gradients, I'm computing gradient of fx0, I'm computing gradient of fx1, gradient of fx2, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm computing, I have the sequence of gradients that I've already computed. I've invested a lot of time and effort in computing this gradient, uh, or the sequence of gradients. And, and I'm getting whatever convergence I'm getting, but I would like to have the convergence speed of the Newton's method. But Newton's method requires me to compute the second order derivative, second derivative of the function, and I don't want to invest the time and effort in computing the second derivative of the function. However, because I have computed the sequence of gradients, I can perhaps estimate what the curvature of the function looks like, at least approximately, if not exactly, I can at least have an approximate idea of the curvature of the function because I have computed the sequence of gradients. And so quasi-Newton method is trying to use that sequence of gradient to come up with the second derivative inverse or an approximation of the second derivative inverse of the function at that point um, so that we are able to run the, we are able to take advantage of the fastness of the Newton's method without actually computing the second gradient of the function. So here is the idea. Let's, let's write down what the, what the gradient descent method is, xk plus one equals xk plus alpha k uh, minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk. And I know that dk has to be a positive definite matrix. And so I have computed at time k, I have gradient of fx0, gradient of fx1, and so on, all the way up to fxk. So that's something we know. Now let's think about this. difference. What do you think this difference is equal to? Let's apply some Taylor series stuff. Well, not equal to, but maybe like approximately equal to. What is this approximately equal to, this difference? What does Taylor series tell you? So a gradient at xk plus 1 minus gradient at xk. So Taylor series tells me that this is equal to the second derivative of the function or rather the gradient of gradient of f which is the second derivative xk plus 1 xk plus 1 minus xk. 
So, so that's the relationship that the two derivatives, two successive derivatives must satisfy. I mean, it's an approximate relationship, so we expect this to be satisfied. And this term here, we would ideally like it to be dk plus 1 inverse. So ideally, let me write here, ideally. There are a lot of approximations we are doing here, okay? So just bear with me. None of these equations are going to be exact, but we'll still just continue for the sake of argument. We'll continue with this train of thought. So I have this bunch of gradients computed. I know that the difference of successive gradients must satisfy this expression approximately. And approximately, my dk plus 1 inverse should be this particular expression, gradient of second derivative of f at xk plus 1. Let me uh, define a few quantities because we'll need it again and again. So I'm going to call xk plus 1 minus xk as pk, or I should write pk on the other side. So I'm going to define pk as xk plus 1 minus xk, qk as uh, and I'm going to define rk as Okay, so I've defined these three quantities and I, I'll need these vectors several times. Uh, you should note all of them are in Rn. So these are all, all like vectors, they are not matrices. What is desired? What do we desire here? So let's, let's write, it, write it down concretely, we want so I'm going back to 1970s. There are a few things we want. We want our dk plus 1 inverse to satisfy this, uh, this equality, this approximation with equality. So first thing we want is we want dk plus 1 qk to be equal to pk. That's this particular equation. That is something we desire. What's the other thing we want? Do we need anything else besides this expression? So even though this is approximate equality, I'm just going to set it, set it to be equal uh, in this situation. Anything else we want from DK? Right, so we want dk plus 1 to be second. We can't really enforce it because how do we know? We haven't really computed the second derivative. So we can't really enforce that constraint on dk. What other constraint do we need to enforce on dk? Something that we can, we can verify. How about dk plus 1 being positive definite? must be positive definite, right? So dk plus 1 has to be positive definite. So if those two constraints are met, uh, I'm going to be happy. Yes, please. Is the, for the first condition, is that from that equation, or did it get rearranged on that? Right. How? 
So this is your, this is my ideally dk plus one inverse. Yeah. So I'm going to take it on the other side. This is my qk. Yeah. This is my pk. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, at time k of the algorithm, I have this, uh, or at time k plus 1, I have this algorithm, I, I, ha I have computed pk, and I have computed qk, and I have computed rk, and I have the value of dk, and I want to come up with dk plus 1. Okay, that's my goal. So that I can run the algorithm at k plus 1 at step, and get xk plus 2 and then repeat everything all over again. So I have all this information. Let's add the third thing. I know that my dk is positive definite because that's by choice. I want my dk plus 1 to be positive definite. So I want my dk plus 1 minus dk to be symmetric. Right, so this is a positive definite matrix, this is a positive definite matrix, I take the difference, it must be a symmetric matrix. And I somehow want to use these three vectors to get this difference dk plus 1 minus dk. Okay, somebody posed this question to me in 1970s, and so now I have to think about how to solve this problem. How would you go about solving this problem? So I have these three requirements that somebody gave to me, and I need to come up with an algorithm which uses these three vectors, these are all in Rn, these three vectors, to get this difference, dk plus 1 minus dk. And once I can estimate that difference, then I can just add this difference to dk, and I get the value of dk plus 1. And hopefully, we will also be able to prove that dk plus 1 is positive definite, and it satisfies this criteria. How, do you, how would you go about solving this problem? Let me raise this side. So somebody gave me this problem. I have to think about it. And let's start with this particular third requirement. So I want my dk plus 1 minus dk to be a symmetric matrix. What is a simple symmetric matrix? Identity Sorry? Identity, Identity matrix. Uh, yeah, that's a symmetric matrix. It's simple as well, but it doesn't answer my question, unfortunately. OK. Can you think a little bit more simpler matrix? Yes? Uh, let me ask, what, one thing sure. about before. Sure. Uh, dk plus 1 has to be symmetric, and dk has to be symmetric in order for the difference to be symmetric. Right, so the difference has to be naturally symmetric. Yeah. yeah. So this is our just starting point. So we know that this is symmetric, this is symmetric. So the difference must be symmetric. So let's think about what kind of symmetric matrices we can come up with. So somebody said identity matrix. Identity matrix is not taking any of this information into account. So I don't quite know how to proceed from there. Any other symmetric matrix one can think of? If you multiply uh, a vector by its transpose. Oh, wow, OK. Uh, so. The other idea is we multiply zk with zk transpose. OK, that's a symmetric matrix. That's a rank 1 matrix, a simplest symmetric matrix. So this is rank 1 symmetric matrix. So 
So I have a rank one symmetric matrix, ZK, ZK transpose. Okay, good. So I have a positive definite matrix. I have a rank one symmetric matrix. Actually, this is not just rank one, this is positive semi-definite. Okay, so it's not just a symmetric matrix, it's actually a positive semi-definite matrix. Let's try to add, a more, add one more scalar. So I want my dk plus one to be dk plus ak zk zk transpose, where I want my requirement is ak must be greater than zero and zk must be in Rn. So now I have two, two things to play with. Does it guarantee the second part? Does this expression guarantee the second part? Is dk plus one going to be positive definite if I, if I make this constraint? So if ak is positive and zk is some vector, then this is a positive semi-definite matrix, this is a positive definite matrix. I add the two, I get a positive definite matrix. So number two is satisfied by making that choice. Number three is satisfied, number two is satisfied. Oh, so I just have to worry about how to satisfy number one. This is pretty much the only thing I need to satisfy. So the question is find AK in AK greater than zero, ZK in RN such that DK plus one QK equals to PK. That's my problem, okay? I need to solve this problem. And I can freely use these three vectors for getting my AK and my ZK. I have three vectors and I have two unknowns. And I have one constraint. Okay. Any questions so far? Anything unusual? Yes, please. Um, just to make this clear, now we are at k time. At k time. And, and we, we have computed xk plus one. We have computed the gradient of xk we plus one. XK plus one. That's right. Using dk. Using dk. Yes. Now the question is, I need dk plus one in order to proceed to the next time step. Of course, the first time around, dk is like... Identity or whatever. You pick dk, d0 is identity or some other symmetric matrix that you are comfortable with. And then we're using dk plus one to calculate... xk plus two. And then we'll go over it all over again. Okay, any other question? Okay, so I'm going to erase this side of the board. I, I hope you will remember the three vectors that I've introduced. Okay. Let's uh, substitute this particular expression in this constraint, so what do I get? I get dk qk plus ak zk transpose qk is equal to pk. Or in other words,
I, I think I should write QK here. Okay, so what this implies, remember I need to find out the value of zk, so I can write it as zk equals to rk over, I guess it will be difficult. Can you see this, uh, what's written below? Okay, so this is a ak zk transpose qk. So this is what my ZK must satisfy. So ZK should be RK divided by AK ZK transpose QK. Now I have a problem. So AK is a positive number, that's fine. ZK transpose QK is some number which I don't know whether it's positive, negative, zero, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not very sure right now. But let's assume for the sake of argument that it's uh, non-zero. I can always do the division. And, but, but zk now is written in terms of zk and in terms of ak. So I'm not really sure what value of zk should be. So let's try to do something else, OK? Uh, I know that AK, ZK, ZK transpose QK is equal to RK. So this implies that AK, ZK transpose QK, ZK transpose QK equals to RK transpose QK. This is another expression I have. So I multiplied both side by QK transpose on, on this, on this, in this equation. So I get that expression. Okay. Any question so far? No question. So let's let's think about it. So this in this particular expression, I know that everything else is scalar, so I can divide it by that scalar and I can get some expression for zk. In this side, I just multiplied by qk transpose on both sides of the equality. So in this case, I don't know the denominator because some things are unknown. In this case, rk transpose qk is completely known. But then I have unknown quantities here. But actually, it's not just any random unknown quantity. We see that in the denominator here, I have AK times ZK transpose QK. And I have AK ZK transpose QK multiplied by ZK transpose QK. So ZK transpose QK comes two times in that particular expression. So I have to do something about it here, because here it only appears one time. But there it appears twice. So what I'm going to do in order to make it appear twice in the denominator, because then I can use this expression, this equality, I can multiply ZK with ZK transpose, and I can multiply it by AK. So let's do that. So AK, ZK, ZK transpose equals to AK, RK over AK, ZK transpose QK times RK transpose over AK, ZK transpose QK.
What's there in the denominator there? Ambassador. Yes, please. How did you get that? Oh. This one? Yeah. So I have this RK here. I have this term here. I can multiply both sides by QK transpose. So what do I get? I get AK, QK transpose ZK, ZK transpose QK. And I have RK transpose QK on this side. Now, QK transpose ZK and ZK transpose QK are the same variable because they are sort of inner product of two vectors. So it's just a scalar. Doesn't matter which way you want to take it, look at it. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay. So what's in the denominator here? Okay, so this is the matrix I care about because this is the matrix that appears here in the update expression for dk plus one. But what I have here is rk, rk transpose over, this ak gets canceled with this ak and in the denominator I have ak, zk transpose qk, zk transpose qk which I exactly know what that expression is equal to. It's RK transpose QK. Let me write it in a different way. So I have one over RK transpose QK and RK RK transpose. This would be my AK and this would be my ZK. The first to the second one. So I have RK RK transpose here. And if you look at the denominator, I have AK, ZK transpose QK, ZK transpose QK, which is exactly RK transpose QK from here. Okay. So anything problematic? Yes, please. Just in the numerator, yes. I mean, denominator is a scalar. So RK is a vector, QK is a vector. So RK transpose QK is a scalar, right? But RK times RK transpose, it's actually a symmetric matrix, R, Rn cross N matrix. So a column vector times a row vector makes it a matrix. But a row vector times a column vector makes it a scalar. So. We are just using that idea here. Okay. What is the problem with this approach? So we came up with a rank one update for DK. So this is a rank one update for DK, uh, which means that I'm adding a rank one matrix to DK to get DK plus one. So I have a, I have a rank one update, uh, AK, ZK, ZK transpose. Uh, what do you think is a problem with this approach? Is there something wrong with this expression for AK, ZK, ZK transpose? What could go wrong in this expression? Something is not matching up to the requirements. Look at the question, the question is, I want to find a positive number AK and a vector ZK such that some expression is satisfied. Because I started with that expression, that expression is satisfied by this uh, choice of AK, ZK, ZK transpose. But then there is something not right in this. What is not right? What have we failed to answer in that question? AK is positive or not. So the only requirement here is that AK should be positive, right? That's a requirement so that I get DK plus one to be a positive definite matrix. Now I got a value of AK, 
but I just cannot, sh I'm not sure whether this is a positive matrix or not. Uh, sorry, it's a positive value, positive number or not. So RK transpose QK could be positive, could be negative. There's nothing, we, we cannot really prove a priori that whether this is positive or not. Okay, so we did the derivation, just like somebody must have done it in 1970s. We did this derivation and we hit a roadblock because AK is no longer a positive number. Like it's not provably a positive number. It could be positive, it could be negative. We just don't know. So our first attempt failed. What should we do now? Our first attempt at updating DK using all the information that we know seems to have failed. Remember, uh, we were trying to come up with the simplest symmetric matrix which can be used to update DK. Okay, the simplest matrix seems to have failed. What should we do? Try the next yeah, try the next simplest <laughs> matrix. So what's the next simplest matrix? Next simplest symmetric matrix, which is positive semi-definite or something, right? Yeah, so what do you want? What did you say? So. Rank two update, okay? So now the question is, okay, rank one update failed. Let's try rank two update. So now, I have essentially the same question, but now I have AK1, ZK1, ZK1 transpose plus AK2, ZK2, ZK2 transpose. So let's try rank two update and update my DK so that we satisfy all the three requirements we had mentioned. Now again, this particular matrix is a rank two matrix, rank two symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. Assuming that AK1 and AK2 are positive numbers, then this is a rank two symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. Now the question is how do we update DK? So somebody went through this whole derivation for rank two matrix which is uh, complicated. Uh, but it's there in some other book on optimization, not in the textbook. But I'll directly give you what the rank two matrix look like. So I'm going to define two more mat uh, vectors, VK, which is PK over PK transpose QK minus So I have this matrix VK. This is a vector in Rn. And my update DK plus one will be DK plus PK PK transpose over PK transpose QK minus It's a very long expression, so I apologize for that. Times. That's my update scheme and my CK should be between zero and one. 
So CK is a tuning parameter here. So CK equals to zero is known as DFP method. CK is equal to one is known as DFGS method. And uh, this is superior. Superior in uh, practice. But this is the first algorithm. So, so this is the first quasi-Newton algorithm. So if you're using Python or, or some other like SciPy packages for optimization, BFGS is one of the methods that are inbuilt in those packages. So it's, it's one of those quasi-Newton methods. Now of course, uh, when CK is equal to zero, this is a rank two update. When CK is equal to one, oh, did I write C1? It should be CK. So when CK is equal to one, this is again a rank two matrix or rank two update. So now, later on, people just said, okay, why not we just add CK between zero and one. Now it becomes a rank three update, but whatever, it, it still works. And the two extreme endpoints are, are rank two updates. The typical inbuilt algorithms will have, will be BFGS method where CK is equal to one. But you know, if, if, if you are implementing the algorithm, you can perhaps through trial and error, identify a more appropriate value of CK, which leads to faster convergence. But that requires some amount of experience. There is no a priori way to, uh, to know that. Now, one thing that we are still curious about is, okay, fine, we do a rank two update, but I have all these numbers in the denominator, numerator, there is a negative sign, how do I know that this is a positive, positive definite matrix? Even though DK is a positive definite matrix, after doing all this complex calculation, there is, I mean, I, I, I'm not very sure whether DK plus one is going to be a positive definite matrix. At least it's not very clear by looking at this expression. So here is the result, which, which we should, know about, so this is the proposition 2.2.1 from the book, uh, nonlinear programming third edition. So DK is positive definite and alpha K is chosen such that gradient FXK plus one transpose DK or FXK transpose DK is less than gradient fxk plus one transpose dk. Then dk plus one is positive definite.
Okay, so if I pick my step size in an appropriate fashion so that this condition is satisfied, then I'm guaranteed that dk plus one is positive definite, uh, starting from a positive definite matrix. So at least in theory, there is a way by which I can ensure that dk plus one is going to be positive definite at all times by an appropriate choice of step size alpha k. Okay, and that's the important contribution of the DFP method and BFGS method. And you know, this, this uh, whole uh, like class of method which is parameterized by CK. Any questions so far? Yes, please. Well, so if your alpha k is chosen according to line minim, so if your alpha k is sufficiently small or chosen according to minimization rule or line minimization rule, this condition is likely going to be satisfied. So you don't have to check for this condition because this is a sufficient condition for dk1 to be positive definite. So, uh, but nonetheless, if you pick alpha k in an appropriate fashion, it's quite likely that dk plus one is always going to be positive definite. Right. Right. So one, one way to check it is you check it at every iteration. And if your alpha k is not meeting the specification, you change your alpha k. Uh, but in most situations, what you will do is you will fix alpha k, run it for like 500 iterations, then again, pick alpha k appropriately, run it for 500 iterations. So you will do it that way. So you won't really check it at every time step. And a lot of experience, when you are running these algorithms for the first time, you don't have experience. But when you are working in a company and you have run this algorithm for 10 years, you have a lot of experience for that specific application. Okay, so, so you will be able to figure it out at that time, how to pick your alpha k. But a lot of the optimization, a lot of this, this stuff is done so as to get the theory, theoretical result. But that doesn't mean that you have to implement it at every time step because it takes a lot of effort to do all these calculations at every point of time. Okay, any other question? Yes, please. Uh, the, the, this situation here, we have a DK, this is, this is, this is the direction of the step K, at, right. at step K, and that's the direction of the next iteration, or no? No, 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 this is not. So DK remains still for the kth iteration, but this is the new point that you have come to. XK plus one is the point XK plus alpha K DK. So, so it doesn't have like Yeah, so this is gradient of F XK plus alpha K DK yeah. transpose DK. Okay, okay. So right? that's not yeah. like the next direction. Correct. That's right. This is not the next direction. Okay, okay. This is the same direction but the next at the next time step. Okay. Yeah, if you pick very large step size, then this condition may not be satisfied. But if your step size is small, then this condition will be satisfied, so. Any other question? Okay. So now let's uh, look at it. So we have PK, QK, and RK. These were the three vectors given to us. Uh, RK doesn't appear here. Uh, uh, so we only have PK and QK and we have DK. And we computed DK in a way by which, uh, so, so, so the goal here was to try and imitate the Newton's method. And what we did was we came up with a nonlinear transformation of PK and QK. These are the two matrices that we know of. So we came up with a nonlinear transformation of PK and QK in order to come up with an update method for DK. Right? One, one could think about it in a slightly different fashion, which is, look, I have computed all these gradients, and I know that there is a nonlinear transformation that could get me to the solution much faster. 
But is there a linear transformation? So I don't want to do nonlinear transformation. I want to do just a linear transformation using all these gradients that I have computed so far so that I can converse to the solution faster. So the goal is still the same. I want to get to the solution as soon as possible. But instead of doing a nonlinear transformation, I want to do a linear transformation. So let's, let's think about what that algorithm is going to look like. Can I erase this side? Everyone has written? OK. So let me talk about, I mean, I'm going to just introduce the next topic. And we'll talk about it in more details in the next class on Wednesday. So the quasi-Newton's method is over. I'm going to talk about momentum methods. Now, of course, I wasn't born in 1970, so I don't quite know what the history is. But the momentum methods were also developed in this particular timeline, 1960s to 1980s, uh, around the same time. And the, the, the quasi-Newton's method was designed in 1970s, so it's all in the same era. But I don't quite know what the history is uh, for this class of methods. So in momentum methods, the idea is I have computed gradient fx0 fxk. And in the gradient method so far, we have talked about, let's just use the current gradient and discard all the past gradients that we have, we have computed. Then quasi-Newton people came in and said, hey, look, you have computed the gradients. Why not just use it in a nonlinear fashion to get to the solution faster and sort of imitate the Newton's method? Now I'm changing the question a little bit, and I'm saying, look, I want to compute xk plus 1 to be xk plus some linear function of gradient fx0, gradient fxk. So by linear function, I mean summation <coughs> alpha k. I, I don't even know whether I should write alpha k. Let me write beta k, because alpha k has to be positive, but beta k can take positive or negative values. Beta k, beta i gradient fxi, i equals 1 to k, or i equals 0 to k. And beta i has to be in real line. Maybe I shouldn't say linear function, but linear span is more appropriate. Not function, but it's fine. I'll just leave it like that. OK. So I have this question that I've computed all these gradients. Uh, I don't want to do any nonlinear computation. I just want to pick appropriate scalars beta i so that xk plus this whole summation can get me closer to the optimal solution. Now, naturally, you have more degrees of freedom here. You have a lot of information from the past. And you have the freedom to pick beta i as you please. So you should be able to get to the solution faster, right? And uh, two people, Poliak and Nesterov, uh, in 1960s and 1980s, respectively, they came up with a class of solutions now known as class of algorithms, now known as momentum methods. So heavy ball method and uh, Nesterov's momentum method. So these are the two methods where we cleverly use, we cleverly pick beta i and use the past gradient information 
to speed up the convergence and get the best theoretical convergence rate that you can get within this class of algorithms. Okay, so we fix the class of algorithms where the descent direction dk has to be a linear span within the linear span of uh, the gradients that you have computed, you have the ultimate lower bound, like you cannot get a better convergence rate than that. And so they came up with methods which can achieve that particular convergence rate. So we'll talk a bit about that in the next class. I'll, what I'm going to do is there is of course a whole bunch of things that I covered in the previous uh, last year's uh, course. I had covered exactly what their line of thinking was with all the proofs and stuff. But I think this year I'm going to skip over the proof and I'm going to directly jump into the momentum method and talk about what exactly that algorithm is about. Instead of talking about the reasons to get to the momentum method. So we'll talk about that in the next class. And if time permits, we will move on to the next topic, which is optimization over convex set. So that's the, we are ending the uh, gradient descent algorithms for unconstrained optimization now. Thank you.